to record and we will go ahead and get started. Well, welcome everyone to our uh, really, a talk that I'm really excited for, a really exciting lunchtime talk um, to Heard the Festive Dude, the fascinating and sometimes hilarious history of the Dude Ranch with Lynn Downey. A couple introductions as we get started. I'm going to be your host for today's program. My name is Janie Adams. I'm the History Engagement Coordinator for the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, I'm also joined today by Dr. David Turpey, the Vice President of Publications and Outreach and the editor of the Journal of Arizona History. So a little bit about the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, the Arizona Historical Society is a nonprofit educational and cultural institution and state agency established in 1864. AHS collects, preserves, and tells the stories of Arizona's past through museum exhibitions, libraries and collections, outreach, educational programs, and publishing. AHS preserves our past, shares our state stories, and connects people through the power of Arizona history. And then our mission statement again, connecting people through the power of Arizona's history, and one of my favorite photographs of um, women workers on the Southern Pacific Railroad during the Second World War. So the Arizona Historical Society operates four museums across the state of Arizona. Uh, we are coming to you, or at least I am, from the Arizona History Museum in Tucson, Arizona. There is also the Arizona Heritage Center in Tempe, the Pioneer Museum in Flagstaff, and then the Sanguinetti House Museum and Gardens in Yuma. So we invite you to stay connected with us at the Historical Society. Um, consider becoming a member of the Historical Society. Not only do members get lots of fun perks like free admission to all of our museums and early access to exhibits and programs and things like that, but members get a copy of the Journal of Arizona History, which is always very exciting to get in your mailbox. Sign up for our email list or follow us on social media. And then another way you can stay connected with us is to order your very fancy Arizona Historical Society license plate through the Arizona Department of or Arizona Department of Transportation, ADOT. Um, visit us at azhs.org today. Uh, some helpful reminders for today's session. So this is a, a Zoom webinar. So Lynn and I, we cannot see you. If you are in the audience, we can't hear you. Um, so if you would like to ask questions, and we encourage you to ask questions, um, please put them in the chat box or use the Q&A feature. Um, this event is recorded and a copy of this recording will be sent to all participants and will also be uploaded to the Arizona Historical Society YouTube channel. Uh, on our channel, we have the vast majority of all of the programs we have ever done in the last couple of years. So uh, if you're looking for something educational, I would encourage you to check that out. And if you enjoyed this program, consider becoming a member at azhs.org membership. All right, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Lynn Downey. Lynn Downey is an award-winning author and historian. She is the former historian for Levi Strauss and Company, which sounds like the coolest job. And she's also the author of Levi Strauss, The Man Who Gave Blue Jeans to the World. She has written two books about Wickenburg, Wickenburg, Arizona, uh, Wickenburg, Images of America, and Arizona's Vulture Mine and Vulture City which was a finalist in Arizona history at the 2021 New Mexico, Arizona Book Awards. Lynn is also a novelist. Her debut novel, Dudes Rush In, which is set in a fiction, on a fictional Arizona dude ranch, won the Will Rogers Medallion Award and placed first in the Arizona historical fiction category at the 2021 New Mexico, Arizona Book Awards. The next book in her series, Dude or Die, will be released in August. Is that August of this year, Lynn? Actually, it will be October, but it's October this year. October of yes. this year. Well, we're still looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, Lynn is the president of the Women of Women Writing the West and works as a consulting archivist and historian. She writes the blog Tumble Reads, a new twist on the old West. 
And without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn. Thank you, Janie. And I wanna thank the Arizona Historical Society for giving me this opportunity to gab about one of my favorite topics. Um, I'm a Californian. I live in the wine country, north of San Francisco, and, uh, but I've been a member of the Arizona Historical Society for many years. And I also look forward to getting my journal in the mailbox. So we're gonna do the uh, share screen thing and hope it works. Give this a try. Let's try this magic here. And um, is it working? There we go. Okay. <clears throat> well, this is the cover of my book, uh, which came out last year. I had the great opportunity to wander around Arizona last November talking to folks about the book. But a little bit about me and how I got started on this whole project. I grew up in a horsey family. Um, the freaked out blonde on the back of Ginger here is me. Um, my uncle raised quarter horses in the suburbs of the eastern part of the San Francisco Bay Area in the 60s when you could still do that. And my cousins rodeoed. This is my cousin Chuck at the Hayward California Rodeo in 1977. So I grew up in this very horsey cowboyish family. I never learned to ride. I didn't get the horse gene. I got the love of Western history gene. And I was able to um, really exercise that love of Western history when I started working for Levi Strauss and Co. Um, as their first company historian back in 1989. And I was there for 25 years. So thanks to my work at Levi's, I got to know the history of the Dude Ranch. And mostly because the company had this catalog of clothing specifically to wear on Dude Ranches called Dude Ranch Duds. This is from 1938. And I thought, clothes just to wear in a dude ranch. And it was satin rodeo shirts and gabardine, you know, riding pants, very Gene Autry, 1930s kind of a movie, you know, movie look. But I, I just became fascinated by this idea that you could go change your clothes, change your way of life for a few weeks and have a Western experience and then take that home with you. I just thought that was something really very special. So I started to collect dude ranch memorabilia. And I'm not obsessed or anything, but I have over a hundred pieces of memorabilia in a box under my office on my desk, like right here. Um, but it's, I just find it so fascinating. It's a unique vacation with no parallel really anywhere else. So how did dude ranches get started? Well, you can't have anything called a ranch without cattle. And the first glimmer of the dude ranch began in the 1880s. A lot of men who had left the East Coast and moved to the, uh, the Rocky Mountain West or the High Plains, started cattle ranches. And then a lot of uh, really wealthy Easterners and even aristocrats from the British Isles came out to uh, go hunting and shoot interesting American animals. But there were no hotels. There was no place for them to stay. So these cattle ranchers would put these men up for free in their homes. They would feed them. It was a courtesy to these people passing through. And among these folks were the Eaton brothers of Pittsburgh. Uh, they had started the Custer Trail Cattle Ranch in Medora, North Dakota in the early 1880s. They were also hosting these visitors to their area. And then one day in 1882, they looked at each other and they said, we're losing money on these guys. This is, the, you know, feeding these guys is eating into our cattle profits. So they put out a guest book in 1882 and started charging $10 a week for uh, these guys to stay at their place and nobody objected. And this was the genesis of the dude ranch. And by 1903, about 20 years later, they realized that they created a new industry because word got out among people who came to visit, including men like Theodore Roosevelt, who had a ranch uh, nearby in the, in the Medora area. So they moved to Wolf, Wyoming in 1903 and set up exclusively as a dude ranch with cattle ranching on the side. And that's considered, Eaton's is considered the first dude ranch and they're still in business today in Wolf, Wyoming in that original location. So this whole idea with this concept of leaving the East to, to uh, come out West and enjoy this cowboy life really, really began to take off. And you start to see the word dude ranch showing up in popular culture. This is a poem uh, that ran in a number of newspapers in 1912. Um, and it's all about how real cowboys are now wrangling dudes. And I, I love the, the last two lines of the first stanza. It's now the cowboy's province to herd the festive dude. And 
this was such a, a fun, an interesting and new concept for people. And a lot of cattle ranches had turned to dude ranching, especially in the years um, prior to World War I. But sometimes, you know, the cattle ranching business and the, the profits go up and down, and it was really profitable to be bringing dudes out to your place. Now, the word dude, not the word dude <laughs> that comes from surf culture, which is a whole other story. Um, the word that we know is dude today is from an old English word, dudas, which actually meant clothes. And it's where we get the word duds from, as in dude ranch duds. By the time the word made it to this side of the Atlantic, dude referred to any man who wore clothing that was a little fancier than it needed to be. And the word really got popular in the 1880s. And a lot was going on back East. Immigrants were coming um, and Feeling, and men were feeling like these people who were not white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were sort of taking over you know, the, where they lived. Um, open wide spaces in the West were being taken over by railroads, Farm, farmland was being eaten up by the railroads. As the Wild West was disappearing, the more men back East wished it was still around. And it's no coincidence that Buffalo Bill's Wild West debuted at the same time as the Dude Ranch. A dude was someone who threatened the, the masculinity of you know, the real men who were coming out West. And they were coming out West to have this, this experience at this dude ranch. So they could, they could have that feeling of openness and wildness again, um, which is what the West was offering to them. So the dude ranch was already in place and deeply embedded in the Rocky Mountain West in the years before World War I. And at the same time, railroads started to collaborate with dude ranches because they realized they made a lot more money with tourists than they made with freight. And a lot of dude ranches were in really remote locations. And the only way to get there was to take the train to the nearest station. And then the ranch owner or the Wrangler would come and pick you up in early years in a wagon and later on in a car or a station wagon. Auto travel was almost non-existent. And so you really depended on the railroad. The dude ranches depended on the railroad to get the people out to where they were. So railroads created these beautiful brochures. This, this particular one from the 1930s is from the Union Pacific Railroad. And it has every dude ranch in its, in its territory. Station you're supposed to get off, you know, how much it costs, the state, the, where you can catch the train to go out wherever you want to go. State by state descriptions of all of the dude ranches. This was really important for dude ranching to be able to get people to come out with this collaboration. Ranches would not have been able to grow without the railroad. Now there's a big difference, and this is still true today, between a hotel and a dude ranch. Dude ranches, you had to make a reservation in advance. And generally you stayed for weeks at a time. And you, when you went to the dude ranch, you, you couldn't just drop in. Even if you had a car, you couldn't just drive up and ask for a room for a few nights like you could with a hotel or later on auto courts or motels. The dude ranch business model was you make a reservation, you come, you stay at the dude ranch and that's all you do for weeks or sometimes an entire season at a time. And that is where you stay, that you are in that bubble of that dude ranch. The other thing you're doing is that you are in the dude rancher's home. If you go to a hotel, you don't know who owns the hotel. You might meet the manager of the hotel if you have a complaint to make. And, but that, there is a separation between management and guest. At a dude ranch, there's no separation at all. You are living with the dude rancher and his family. And that dude rancher and his wife and their children are involved with every single activity day after day. It's a completely different feeling than just going to a hotel. It was it, the flip side of impersonal, this deeply, deeply personal. And many people would come back to the same dude ranch year after year after year. So it was in the years before World War I that entrepreneurs in Arizona started to see how popular dude ranches were getting in Montana and Wyoming. They said, hey, we should do this because people can't go to dude ranches in Montana and Wyoming in the wintertime, but they can come here. So ranches started opening up in Arizona and there were two areas where the majority of these ranches were clustered. One was Wickenburg and the other was Tucson. Wickenburg um, and many of these ranches are on this really fun um, postcard from the 1930s. 
But Wickenburg is considered the place where the very first dude ranch was opened in the state of Arizona. Um, whoops, wrong one. Um, it was called the Garden of Allah. And it's with, uh, what the, the Hacienda River, River Preserve uh, is now outside of Wickenburg. But it was an old stage stop and then it had been a farm. And then an entrepreneur, a couple of entrepreneurs from Phoenix decided to open a dude ranch. And they did that in about 1912. Then in 1913, the associate editor of the mag a magazine called Arizona, the state magazine, a woman named Etta Gifford Young, wrote an article about this Garden of Allah. And this, just this, I have to read you the title because it's hilarious. It's called <clears throat> The Garden of Allah, a comfortable resort where swimming pool, tennis court, saddle ponies, shade, running water, and chicken dinner make the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest which is a very long description without using the word, but a very long description of what a dude ranch is. And the Garden of Allah was not around um, for very long, um, but other people in Wickenburg took notice. And by the 1920s, by the 1930s, Wickenburg was calling itself the dude ranch or guest ranch capital of the world. And it was a, a moniker they kept well into the 1990s. This is actually for my collection, it's a postcard. It's a cowboy hat shaped postcard that was set out, I think in the 1950s. So one of the um, uh, dude ranches opened fairly soon after the Garden of Allah was the KL Bar, which is still in business today in Wickenburg. And it was founded um, around 1916 by cowboy singer, uh, Romaine Loudermilk, who might, whose, whose name might be familiar to many people who know Arizona history. Um, and throughout the 20s, Dude ranches came and went, or dude ranches would stay, but they changed names and new people would, would buy them. And then in the 1940s, you get ranches like the Flying E, which is still around today, and Rancho de los Caballeros, Los Cab, in Wickenburg, also um, still in business today in Wickenburg. So Wickenburg was really one of those centers of dude ranching um, and really was certainly the dude ranch capital of Arizona for a very, very long time. The Phoenix area had quite a few. Uh, ranches between the 1920s and the 1970s, uh, 52 dude ranches came and went in the Phoenix area. Many of them were clustered around um, Mesa and Tempe. One of them was Saguaro Lake Ranch um, outside of Mesa. Um, it was originally the construction camp for workers building the Stewart Mountain Dam between 1928 and 1930. And new owners bought it uh, from the Salt River Project in the early 1930s and turned it into a dude ranch. And it was in well in business well into the 1970s. In fact, in 1975, the co-owner, a woman named Dorothy Vale Kissinger, um, was tapped to be on President Gerald Ford's National Commission on the Observance of International Women's Year. So, you know, what you think is a sort of remote dude ranch, um, was able to make have influence on the entire nation. And dude ranching was in the 1950s into the 70s, still a cultural force. And we move into Tucson and you have places like Tanca Verde, which started as many did as a cattle ranch. And it became a dude ranch around 1928 under a new owner uh, with, that named it the Green Tank later on Tanca Verde, which is you know, a better name. Um, it has had a succession of owners and of course is, is still um, open today and a very, very popular ranch. Also in Tucson is White Stallion Dude Ranch. Um, it, was a, it was a cattle ranch when the True family bought it in the 1960s um, and is still owned by the next generation of, of the True family. It was the backdrop for zillions of TV shows and movies, Western TV shows and movies because of its incredible landscape and views. Um, the TV show, The High Chaparral, uh, was one of the one of the shows that was there very frequently. Also in the 20s, Circle Z Ranch in Patagonia. Um, again, also the backdrop for many episodes of TV shows like Gunsmoke and films. The southwestern um, landscape, Arizona's landscape, personified the western to so many people. You know, so many westerns are filmed in this area because it's close to Hollywood. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sunshine. And so the, the Southwestern Dude Ranch, the Arizona Dude Ranch really began to personify what a dude ranch was between its Southwestern uh, architecture and certainly the landscape. 
Rancho de la Osa opened in the, also in the 1920s. Um, and it has what is considered Arizona's oldest continuously occupied building. It was called the Cantina for many years and now it's a room at the Dude Ranch uh, that's used for special events. The original building was constructed by Father Eusebio Kino in the early 1700s. And most of that building is still original and still standing okay, on the property of Rancho de la Rosa. So the Tucson area did its bit for the war effort during World War II. Um, in December of 1943, four women air WACs, WAC stands for Women's Army Corps, who were stationed at the Marana um, uh, Army Airfield, north of Tucson, spent their three-day pass at the Flying V Ranch outside of Tucson. Now the WACs supported the Air Force as teletype operators, clerks, photographers, dispatchers. So the women got a ride from the airfield into Tucson. The Wrangler from the Flying V came out and picked them up them back to the ranch. They changed into clothes. This is one of them had changed their clothes. Obviously in this photo, two of them had not. Um, they put on Western clothing. They did everything from riding to calf roping. And when their three days were over, one of the women told the ranch owner she finally had something to write home about. So I guess her, her job as a teletype operator was not as exciting as being on a dude ranch. Now the Oracle area, also had a couple of dude ranches. One was the Triangle L, which also had started off as a cattle ranch and was purchased by um, an architect and artist named Westray Ladd, um, who, I forget what his early name was, but renamed it the Triangle L. Um, and then he, his brother inherited it on his death and he sold it to um, a man named Trowbridge and he ran it as a dude ranch from 1924 to about 19. It's now an artist's collective um, I had the privilege of giving a lecture last November when I was when I was in Arizona to talk about my book. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, place to visit. I really enjoyed it. And Rancho Linda Vista, uh, George Wilson and his wife bought an old adobe in the area in 1911. They named it the Rancho Linda Vista. It was a dude ranch as well by the late 1920s. And it today is the Rancho Linda Vista artist community. And I just love it that two former dude ranches in Oracle who are now devoted to art. I'm fascinated by the afterlives of dude ranches, though it's not always easy to find them. Sometimes they close down and, you, and they just go away and you never know what happened. But I love the, the reuse of dude ranching now um, for artistic endeavor. Um, the, um, a, lot of, a lot of dude ranches, created postcards about their location to, you know, to sell to tourists. But the, by the 1930s, the Dude Ranch was so well known that companies created sort of generic Dude Ranch postcards that people could buy and send when they visited the ranch. The Kurt Teich Company um, of Chicago created, like the, remember the slide, a few slides earlier of the Arizona, that famous view, you know, greetings from all those state postcards that was created by the Kurt Teich Company of Chicago. In the 1930s and 40s, they created a series of 10 cards called Dude Ranch Comics. And this is um, one of the creepier ones. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it really plays on the popular phenomenon of Eastern women, which were called dudines, by the way, the female form of the word dude. Eastern dudines coming west to, and then they end up marrying the Wrangler or they end up finding themselves a cowboy. And this played on that, on that popular theme. Um, and that did happen. Dudines would marry their cowboy and nine times out of 10, those marriages didn't last, but they, they had those few minutes when they, when they had their cowboy. Um, the story of women in dude ranching, I could talk all day about it, but I want to focus on one aspect and that is the Nevada Divorce Ranch. In 1931, the state of Nevada legalized gambling and set a six week residency limit in, within the state of Nevada to get a quickie divorce. It used to take months or years to get a divorce, but if you went to the state of Nevada, stayed within its borders for six weeks, you could get granted a divorce after that short period of time. So a lot of dude ranches started saying, hey, dudines, you know, come out, come out out here, you future divorcees, come out to our ranch. Some dude ranches opened up specifically to be divorce ranches for these people to stay. And the best version, the best iteration of this concept in film is the movie, The Women from 1939, which if you haven't seen it, you must have seen it. 
all of the all these all of these Park Avenue women who wear Adrian gowns when they're home in New York all go. They get on the train for Reno, and a lot these were mostly clustered around Reno. They get on the train for Reno. They spend their time on the Dude Ranch in Nevada, and then they go home with their divorces. But one thing they do when they first arrive is they change the way they dress because they realize they were in alien territory. They're in a way station between their old life and their new life. And that called for new clothes, especially in Reno, which was so alien to these women's experience. So they made this attempt to look Western. So if you're Paulette Goddard on the left, you're wearing white linen hot pants and leather gauntlets. And if you're Mary Boland on the right, you're wearing jeans, a flannel shirt, five ropes of pearls, and a diamond brooch. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it, and this is the most fun for me to see, especially with my history working for Levi Strauss and Co. and understanding the idea of clothing being made specifically for dude ranches. To see it in this film is really fun. But again, it, and, but it also has a, a more profound sense as these women are in this transition period um, before they go back to New York to go on with the next phase of their lives. Dude Ranch clothing, whoops, oops, I missed something, oh, here we go. And Dude Ranch clothing did move into um, popular, popular culture um, and into eventually into suburban backyard parties. So a uh, film took up the topic of dude ranching in 1919 with a silent called Wrangling Dudes. It's a lost silent. I have never been able to find this film. And I did a lot of research when I was writing my book trying to find movies that had dude ranch themes. And I found a lot of them online or on Turner Classic Movies. Uh, but this one is gone. It was filmed in Montana and it allegedly shows dude ranches having fun on a Montana dude ranch in 1919. Um, and I wish I could find it. But it's the first, it's the first film to use dude, use dude ranching as a plot device and not just a, a location for a film shoot, which happened um, earlier than that as well in the silent era. Um, even Hopalong Cassidy joined the Dude Ranch Film Brigade in 1938's Sunset Trail. So Hopalong Cassidy here in the middle in a suit, um, he has to pretend to be a dude to go incognito onto a dude ranch to solve the murder of the ranch owner's father. And so he pretends to be a dude. He isn't very good at cards. He, isn't, he doesn't, you know, he's not good on horses. But once he... Had, takes on this persona, he's able to ferret out the killer. And then at the end of the film, he goes back into his all black, you know, black clothing, black hat on his white horse and becomes Hopalong Cassidy again. But he also had to change clothes in order to be legitimately a dude to, you know, to play this an incognito role to solve this crime. A crime showed up in a lot of books about dude ranching over the years. This is a, a murder mystery from the 1930s. Death on a Dude Ranch. Um, there were a number of books about dude ranches um, that were serious stories as well, all the way back to the 1920s. The main story in these books is usually an Eastern guy, a fumbling dude comes out West to a dude ranch and he falls for the local cowgirl or she's the daughter of the dude ranch owner. She's a real cowgirl. And he has to undergo some sort of transformation or meet some sort of challenge in order to be worthy of this cowgirl he's fallen in love with. And that's a classic theme you see not only in books, but also in, in many of the other films um, that took up dude ranching as a topic. Then there are sillier stories about dude ranching. There's Cherry Ames, dude ranch nurse. Cherry Ames was the Nancy Drew of the nursing world. She would go from um, client to client to client and help a family or solve a mystery. Um, in this particular one, uh, she helps the family. Um, what did she do in this one? I can't even seem to remember. Um, but she helps the, the family um, find some missing documents. Um, and But my favorite part of this whole thing is the cover, where there she is in her pristine white nurse's uniform next to a corral where dust is being you know, thrown up. And she's you know given the, the glad eye to the cowboy in her perfect white uniform. Music is part of the Dude Ranch experience, but not the way it's portrayed in films, especially in Gene Autry's films. His very first film in which he sang was in Ken, the Ken Maynard movie in Old Santa Fe. Ken Maynard couldn't sing and the producers wanted a musical interlude and they'd heard about this Gene Autry guy. So he did a 
some about the middle of the film, he he did this musical interlude and people went crazy and he just that his career took off like that. And in many other films, he plays a dude ranch owner or a visitor to a dude ranch and at some point sings or has the house band back him up and he provides music for the dudes for entertainment. Well, no, no dude ranch had a house band. <laughs> that was only in Gene Autry's films. And I often wonder if people were a little bit disappointed if they went to a dude ranch and you know there was no bandstand. But guests were encouraged to bring instruments on their trips. There was always a piano and the, there was always a main sort of lodge. And there was always a piano because in the evenings, people would entertain themselves. The dude ranch owner would sit with them. Their people would play the piano and sing. They would play cards, they'd play board games. Um, if there were kids, you know, there were even more board games. And so evenings were spent together in the main lodge. Again, how different is that from a hotel where you go to your separate room or you go out or whatever? At the dude ranch, you're all there together as this unit with the dude ranch owner and you entertain yourselves. I interviewed a woman who, uh, she and her husband ran a Colorado dude ranch in the 1960s. And every Friday night, the staff entertained the um, guests and they had talent shows for the staff and for the guests. So there was always something to get, to bring people out of themselves. And this is these were periods of time from the 30s, seriously, into the 60s and 70s where people knew how to entertain themselves and the dude ranch made that possible. Even uh, music from dude ranches made it you know, into suburbia by the 1950s. It's kind of blurry, but this is the album cover <clears throat> from 1950 of a uh, a record, a vinyl called Dude Ranch Dances, which you could play at your dinner party or after your dinner party where you could have dancing out in your patio, in your, you know, suburban, in your suburban home. Now, the most important employee at the Dude Ranch next to the Wrangler was the cook. Because if your guests did not like your food, they're going to go home and tell their friends, oh, don't go to that Dude Ranch. The food was terrible. The cook was so important. And I read so many stories about the lengths to which dude ranchers did, did anything they could to keep a good cook. There was an organization that's still in business today. It's called the Dude Ranchers Association. It's the trade organization for dude ranchers. And they inaugurated their own magazine in 1931 called the Dude Rancher. And they always had a lot of recipes. So this is a recipe from 1943 for something called cowboy in a sack. Now this is during the war when dude ranchers were rationed in terms of sugar and everything else, just like everybody else was. So this is the recipe. It sounds very unappetizing. It's basically an English boiled pudding. You steam this thing in a flour sack in boiling water or throw it all on a coffee can. Um, the best part, however, is at the bottom because you can serve it with hard sauce, which is whiskey, butter, and sugar. You can also serve it with lemon sauce. Now, the same recipe was reprinted in the 1955 edition of the Dude Rancher magazine. And it did not uh, suggest serving it with hard sauce, but serving it only with lemon sauce. That is likely because there were a lot more children going to Dude Ranches in the 1950s and you're not gonna wanna be passing around you know, the hard sauce at the table. Just stick with the lemon sauce. So I would be remiss in my responsibility to you as a historian if I did not tell you the story of Sally Rand's nude ranch. Yes, you heard me right. Sally Rand was a burlesque dancer back in the 1930s, a fan dancer, a stripper. And it, at the 1936 Frontier Centennial, she debuted an attraction called Sally Rand's Nude Ranch. It was this big building. And the title, Sally Rand's Nude Ranch, was in great big letters above it. And when you first look at the sign, just like it is here on this program, it looks like it says dude, but then you notice the D is crossed out and there's an N put there instead. Because what was inside this attraction? A number of extremely scantily clad young women, usually only wearing cowboy hats, holsters, and maybe they've got a gun in the holster and that's about, oh, and boots and cowboy boots, and that's it. And they're cavorting around in the back, you know, and they're in this sort of faux Western landscape. They're playing badminton, they're feeding the chickens, they're just chatting to each other. And it's, you pay your dime and you go through and you look at the nude cowgirls and you're on your way. Very popular attraction. 
to the point where she was invited to bring her nude ranch to the 1939 Golden Gate International Exposition in San Francisco Bay. The Army Corps of Engineers built Treasure Island off of the San Francisco Bay Bridge specifically for this World's Fair. And it was to celebrate the opening of both the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge in 1937. So it opened in 1939. Um, she had the same setup, although the building at, at this event was very territorial style and not just sort of a big block building, but it, she'd really upped her game in terms of her architectural style. Um, and uh, apparently the line was just out the door the very first day. Um, she did the same thing. She had her girls with hardly anything on doing their sort of Western um, activities. And it, this, was, uh, this was an attraction for the run of the fair, which went on uh, well into 1940. Sally Rand eventually uh, quit the burlesque stripping world and she <laughs> married a cowboy. She married a rancher. The marriage didn't last, but they actually bought a ranch in Montana. So she stuck with that Western theme. And in the interest of full disclosure, I will tell you that my 15 year old father went to the fair and tried to get into Sally Rand's nude ranch, but they wouldn't let him because he was too young. We're getting into the 1940s and 1950s, more children are going to dude ranches. And so dude ranching, dude ranchers are expanding their merchandising efforts to things like this, also part of my collection, dude ranch paper dolls, full of clothes I would wear anytime, just fabulous, fabulous Western wear clothing for these paper dolls. And again, this was this is because kids were coming and in the 1950s and the post-World War II era, people have cars and they can drive to the dude ranch. That doesn't mean they, you know, they just drive up and stay for a couple of nights. You still had to make a reservation. Your dude ranch vacation was where you stayed. That didn't change. But you didn't have to get picked up at the train station like, like the old days. And eventually the trains just went away and everybody went to the dude ranches in their cars. But that was a little further in the future. Television started to take on the topic of dude ranching occasionally. The TV show Death Valley Days from the 50s and 60s had a couple of dude ranch themed episodes. Also the Spin and Marty uh, uh, show that was part of the Mickey Mouse Club in the 1950s. It was a boys dude ranch. And Spin and Marty were you know, these boys having adventures at this boys dude ranch as part of the Mickey Mouse Club. One of my favorite TV Appearances of a Dude Ranch is in uh, a Perry Mason episode from 1959 called The Case of the Petulant Partner. And Perry Mason, Della Street, and Paul Drake all stay at, at the real White Sun Guest Ranch in Palm Springs. And it's actually mentioned in the episode. And I think it was filmed there because there they are, you know, in the Dude Ranch, helping to solve, you know, yet another mystery. So we're getting into the 1960s and in the 1950s and early 60s, television had dozens of Western shows on air. Western TV shows, Rawhide, The Rifleman, Gunsmoke, Wyatt Earp, Tombstone Territory were hugely popular. But as you get into the 1960s, what people really wanted to see, especially new teenagers wanted to see, were shows about young people, not shows about cowboys. Whenever interest in the West sort of waned, that had an effect on who was going to dude ranches and the business of dude ranching. So dude ranchers had to get kind of creative and they did a lot of promotions with consumer brands. So this is from 1956, I think. And they, they did a, a number of dude ranches. This was, um, it was the, the Ride and Rock Dude Ranch of Scottsdale, Arizona, offered two weeks at a dude ranch for five boys and five girls. And it was a pro promotion with Red Ball Jets very, very popular shoes um, among young people. And there were a lot of promotions like this well into the 1970s. Television shows made occasional reference to dude ranches in the 70s. There was a episode of Happy Days. The Cunningham family went to a dude ranch. I believe that was a two-parter. There was even, a, even Charlie's Angels even went to a dude ranch in one episode. And then in 1980, a movie came out which helped revive interest in the West and had a, a profound effect on dude ranchers and their business, and that was Urban Cowboy. The movie was actually based on a 1978 Esquire article about how city guys mostly were flocking to Western themed bars to drink whiskey and ride a mechanical bull. And so this just fomented an interest in the West, Western culture, Western lifestyle, Western um, language across all segments of society. And people wanted to 
go to dude ranches to have, you know, they wanted to spend more time than just an evening in a bar. And Arizona ranches saw this uptick. Um, this is um, a headline from the March 24th, 1981 issue of the Flagstaff Arizona Daily. His urban cowboys are saddling up and going to dude ranches. In fact, the manager of the Wickenburg Chamber of Commerce said this, it's the urban cowboy craze. People are looking for more than a mechanical bull in the city. They're saying, let's get out where it really happens. And they did for a long time. So we're getting into the early 1980s. Guess who had a house band? <laughs> the Rimrock Dude Ranch in um, Wyoming near Yellowstone actually had a house band in the early 80s called the Rim Rockers. This is a picture of the Rim Rockers. But as the 80s waned, interest in the West waned, and, and so dude ranching saw that dip, you know, in reservations again, until 1991, when another movie came out. And if this was a live audience, I would ask you all, what movie came out in 19, 1991 that changed everything for dude ranching? And if you said City Slickers, you'd be right. And most people did say that if I was with live audiences. City Slickers, whenever I told people I was writing this book, they said, oh, are you going to write about City Slickers? And I said, yes, but it is not a dude ranch movie. It's not a movie about a dude ranch. In fact, at the beginning of the movie, it, the, the man who owns the cattle ranch where they're going to do the cattle drive says, you know, if you think this is a dude ranch, you know, think again. This is, this is not fantasy. This is not play acting. This is where it really happens. It's a cattle drive movie. But... People think it's a dude ranch movie. For one thing, there's that short scene at the beginning where all, they're all trying on different clothes and trying on different hats. And, and then they're trying to learn to rope and to ride. They're definitely dudes at the beginning of this movie. But the theme of Easterners coming to a dude ranch, meeting challenges, overcoming obstacles and going home transformed is exactly what this movie is about. These three schlubby guys, they're all at crisis points in their lives and they meet the challenge of the West and they go home and they're different men. And that's exactly the theme of every novel about dude ranching back to the 1920s and very many dude ranching films as well. So the dude ranch you know, continues to go in and out of cultural favor, but I will tell you the Yellowstone effect is very profound for dude ranchers today. Um, and it's interesting to see how the things that have affected um, dude ranches over the years. During the pandemic, um, after the first few months of freak out was over, people wanted to get away. They wanted vacations. Um, and dude ranches offered an outdoor vacation where it was safe. And, and along with the kind of protocols we had, to, we had to go through at the beginning of the pandemic, people flocked to dude ranches. Ranchers told me they saw a huge uptick in reservations um, in 2020. And they saw those people re-up and sign up to come back the following year. Dude, the Dude Ranch served a deep purpose and filled a need at a very freaky time um, in American society. And I think that's very profound. And the other reason that Dude Ranchers are still around today is because they've adapted to changes in tourism, changes in the way people want to take vacations. Um, and if, you know, if dude, dude, some Dude Ranchers offer the same kind of thing they did in the 30s very rustic, you go there, maybe you, you know, you get up at dawn, you help herd the cattle, you do real heavy duty cowboy stuff. You can do that. You, or you can go all the other direction and you can go to a dude ranch that's a four-star resort that has farm to table program and four-star chefs, destination weddings. But the one thing that's, that every dude ranch has, and it's not a dude ranch without them, is horses. It's always about horses. It's always about riding. It's always about that cowboy feel that Americans have wanted to make part of their lives for 140 years. And that's why dude ranches are still around. So I want to end my talk with um, a couple of stories, one of which is about my favorite headline in my year and a half, almost two years of doing research for this book. I did a lot of newspaper research. This was my favorite newspaper headline, Vampire to Retire to Dude Ranch. So this article is about Bela Lugosi who had finished making a film and told an interview, a, a reporter from a movie magazine, um, that 
he had one of his ambitions was to retire and open a dude ranch. Maybe he'd buy property in California next to his friend, the cowboy star, Buck Jones, but he really wanted to open a dude ranch. So I read this article and I thought, no, this, this can't be right. So I tracked down Bela Lugosi's granddaughter. And she was very, very sweet, and very kind. She said, well, although my grandfather loved the outdoors, who knew? Let me ask my dad, Bela Lugosi Jr., if my grandfather ever wanted to open a dude ranch. So she got back to me fairly quickly and she said, no, um, he never evidenced any interest in dude ranching. He never went to one. It, it's a mystery. Well, it isn't a mystery to me because I think he was just messing with the reporter. He was probably tired of reporters asking him all this stuff about what he wanted to do with his life. And so he decided to just make something up. And he chose the dude ranch as the thing to tease this reporter with because the dude ranch in 1937, when this happened, was the thing, such an important cultural force. And I just love the fact that Bela Lugosi chose that when he wanted to mess with a reporter. And then the final story I want to tell you is an experience I had at the White Stelling and Dude Ranch in Tucson. It was last year, and I was at the Tucson Festival of Books. Uh, my book had just come out, and I was staying at the White Stallion Ranch, uh, run by my friend Russell True. Now, um, I was only there in the evening. I was gone all day, both Saturday and Sunday, at the, um, at the book festival. And everybody else at the Dude Ranch was either there, they were a couple, they were there as a family or a group of friends, and I was just by myself. So the first night at dinner, Friday night, <clears throat> I'm just sort of, and it's every, dinner is served buffet style in a big, in one big dining room where everybody sits together. And my Friday night, you know, I'm lumbering up there with my little tray by myself. And I, I found, you know, I sat down next to a couple of people and we sort of chatted throughout dinner, but I didn't really, you know, connect with anyone. And then Saturday night I was in line and I was talking to the woman in front of me who had complimented me on the Western shirt I was wearing. And we had finished picking up our food at the same time. And I said, I'm here by myself. May I join you for dinner? She's like, sure. But she doesn't go into the main dining room. She goes into a private dining room in the other direction where they're having a family reunion. So I go through the door and I'm like, oh, oh, no, I don't want to crash your family reunion. And she's like, no, it's fine. So she sits me down next to the matriarch of this family. Her name is Barbara. She lives in Tucson and she knows the people at the White Stallion Ranch. She had gathered every member of her family, and there were only about 30 of them to have this vacation together at the White Stallion Ranch for maybe the last time before the older members of the family begin to pass away. And so I, I just thought that was amazing. And, and I sat down next to her and I was telling her who I was and I'd written this book about dude ranching, et cetera, et cetera. And then people started coming in and sitting at our table and looking at me kind of funny because they didn't know who I was. Everybody who came in, she said, this is Lynn, she's part of our family tonight. That would never happen to you at a hotel. That only happens at a dude ranch. And that personifies the feeling at the dude ranch and is a reflection of the owner himself, Russell, and who also reflects, I know, I, I know this would happen at just about every other dude ranch. The family feeling you get when you go to a place like this. I met a couple who've been coming to the White Stallion for nearly 30 years. And there were other people who, who had come for year after year after year. Groups of friends will go back to the same dude ranch year after year because of that, fit, that feeling that it generates. And this is one of the other reasons dude ranches are still with us and why it was such a joy to write this book. And I'm continuing to go to dude ranches. I'm going to a historic one in Montana in July. And I hope to continue writing about dude ranching for a lot longer. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. And this is the shameless commerce slide of the uh, presentation where you can find me online, where you can buy the book, and feel free to um, send me an email through my website as well. I want to thank you all again, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Lynn. I, I have been texting Dr. Turpy this whole time and have been like, I need to know more about <laughs> <laughs> I need to know more about this. <laughs> well, actually, may I put in a plug for the oh. Journal of Arizona History, if I may. Um, I wrote an article for Dr. Turpy and the Journal of Arizona History 
about the history of Arizona dew drenching, and it will be, I believe, in the winter issue, and I'm very excited about it. We're really excited about that too. That's uh, that's definitely um, that's definitely up our alley. So there's a question here, uh, and it says, "Are there new dude ranches still opening?" I think there are, but not very many. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people think it would be really fun to open a dude ranch, and then they do it, and they realize that it's not only a lot of work, but it's also very expensive. Um, one way to find out that information is to go to duderanch.org, which is the Dude Ranchers Association website. And there's a lot of information there about all of the ranches that are open today by state. And um, you could even email them and ask them um, if there are any that, that are opening today. But it's, um, it's a business that is continually changing. It's hard to keep up. Yeah, definitely. You talk about the, the Yellowstone effect, and I think that I think that all of us historians of the West, or or people who are who are Westerners, are seeing that, and it's it's kind of funny to see happen. Yeah, I you know one one thing I've heard from people occasionally is, oh well, the, you know the dude ranch, it's it's just for fun, you know, it's not it's not really the West, it's not really cowboys, and I just you know want to scream because A, my entire book is about how dude ranching is absolutely a part of the West. But the dude ranchers I know, they're real cattle ranchers. They're generations of cattle ranchers and who had chosen to open dude ranching because A, they love people and they know that it's, it's a viable business and it's a way to have another business avenue on top of their actual cattle business. So I, I will arm wrestle anybody who wants to argue with me about whether dude ranches are really Western or not. <laughs> uh, all right, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So we'll just end a little bit early, but thank you so much, Lynn, for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you for the invitation. This was so much fun. I really appreciate it. <laughs> all right, everyone, take care. Thank you.